evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's it going? Um, thank you all for coming out for on such an awful evening. So thank you so much for being here. A few housekeeping announcements. First of all, um, the emergency exits are through that double door there that you just come in. And the ladies and gents are through the double door and up the left and up the right of the stairs and marble staircase. So on behalf of Engineers Ireland Cork, the Irish Planning Institute and the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation and Cork City Council, I would like to welcome you all to City Hall. Tonight's seminar is a holy trinity event between these three professional institutes, institutions and it gives me such warmth and hope that professional bodies can come together to share ideas and ultimately work together to achieve a common goal. Cork City is a project and we are all team members with a duty to step up and contribute to this project. Please be advised that tonight's presentation is going to be webcast. Tonight's presentation will focus on the revitalization of Cork City Centre and the influence of sustainable travel has on the vibrancy and health of an area. Each speaker will deliver an approximately 15 to 20 minutes presentation and a Q&A session will be held after all four speakers. So hold your questions until then, okay? Uh, unfortunately, Paul, one of our speakers, has another prior engagement so you won't be in attendance at the Q&A, but uh, I believe uh, Lorcan and Kevin are gonna step up and answer any difficult questions. So thank you to Paul, Lorcan, Kevin, and Stefan, Stefan, oh, Stefan how's it going? Um, for agreeing to deliver um, their presentations. And by way of introduction, here's a short bio of the speakers. So Paul McGurk is the city center coordinator for Cork City Council's economic section. He's been involved in local and economic development for over 20 years in Galway, Dublin, and Cork. And his career to date has involved facilitating and supporting partnerships between public, private, and voluntary sectors. He's Cork born, bred and reared, graduate of University College Cork, and currently studying with the Institute of Place Management in Manchester. Lorcan Griffin here to my left is an urban planner and urban design professional working with Cork City Council since 2015, having worked in urban and regional planning for the past 15 years. He's currently a member of Cork City Centre Steering Group, tasked with managing and fostering Cork City Centre as the healthy heart for the city and wider metropolitan area. He's also a member of Cork City Council's planning policy team, and he's developed skills to support the delivery of good urban design and planning policy principles and guidance through active engagement with local communities and other city stakeholders. Kevin Burke is an urban mobility and town planning consultant with a diverse background, having worked at regional and local government levels across Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Now working for Jacobs Engineering in Cork, Kevin holds a master's degree in town and county planning from Queen's University, Belfast. He lectures in transport planning and urban mobility for the master's planning course in Un University College Cork and has presented on numerous mobility and cycling conferences. Kevin is passionate about reducing transport's impact on the environment and creating vibrant, cohesive, safe and prosperous cities and communities. And as an active Twitter uh, <coughs> poster, <coughs> tweeter, <sighs> Stefan. Stephen Cock is the Commuter Plan Manager at University College Cork since 2006 with a degree in Transport Engineering and Planning from Technics Universität Berlin. Apologies for the pronunciation. He's a member of the Cork Transport and Mobility Forum, the Cork Cycling Campaign and Cyclist.ie and represents Cork City Public Part Participation Network on the Council's Road and Trans Transport Strategic Policy Committee. The UCC Commuter Plan is an integral part of UCC sustainability strategy and one of the pillars of UCC Green Campus and UCC was the first university in Ireland to operate their own park and ride. Other initi initiatives pioneered by UCC with sports were, um, by Stefan as well was the campus bike set up in 2011, three years before the Cork City Bikes, Coke Bikes. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to the first speaker, which is Paul. Thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you for all the institutes for inviting us. Um, I must confess I'm not a planner or an engineer, so I hope you'll still bear with me. Um, and the second point was to make sure the questions are really hard because Larkin and Kevin are really, <laughs> they like to be tested, okay? So, and I apologize, I have to leave early, but it was originally Monday night and we were something else clashing. Uh, so look, really, I'm, this is an excuse for me to provide loads of nice images of the city centre. Um, I'm gonna take you through the first half of this presentation um, and then Larkin will take you through the second half. So the format is, um, we're gonna talk about the city centre strategy, uh, talk about some of the capital developments. Uh, a lot of you are probably involved in those. Uh, I see some faces that are involved in some of those anyway. Um, then I suppose what's, I suppose what's more interesting and maybe feeds on to some of the second topic is to talk about some of the, the place making and some of the events and some of the uh, creating that sense of place. Uh, and then Larkin's going to talk about the structures, uh, some of the key challenges that are faced that the city centre is facing and then some of the talks and seminars that we've had during the year. And as, as I said, then the, the Q&A. 
Um, as Stephanie said, or sorry, uh, Valerie said, the aim of the strategy is to deliver a healthy heart for the region. Uh, that Cork City Centre will be will drive on the whole region. The strategy goes back to 2014. It was probably 2015 before it, it began to be implemented, and since then there's been yearly action plans. Um, and every two years, I see somebody reading the brochure that was outside. We produce that every two years just to bring people up to speed as to what's happening. There's three elements to it. There was uh, improvement and development, management and marketing. Um, so improvement in its broadest terms, obviously physical improvement, but also improvement in some of the structures. <coughs> there was three models of management um, proposed, and uh, I suppose we've gone. I suppose what was uh, there was a, a bid, or the council carrying on its own structure are setting up uh, a partnership uh, so we with that model and Larkin will talk about that and obviously marketing in the city centre. Uh, these are some of the capital developments that's, again that's in the brochure slightly out of date because it goes back to last March we'll do another one in the new year um, it shows you the breadth of development that's happening after probably 10 years of, of no growth really and um, what's great about I suppose the development is there's such a mixture uh, a lot of offices hotels education institutes tourism some retail uh, so I'll go through some of those for you now. Uh, you probably see, uh, even just across the way, that's the CGI. Uh, you can see the real thing now across the way. It's open in two weeks' time. That's the new Maldon Hotel. But there's up to a 30% increase expected in bedrooms. Um, depends on the economy, but uh, there's seven new hotels and seven extensions. But a report out last week predicted that by 2022, there'd be 930 bedroom, extra bedrooms in the city centre. Office developments, there's no shortage of office developments. Again, you can see around here, uh, Navigation Square, they're on site with the second block. Again, there's probably somebody here involved. South Mall will be uh, open, uh, that's for, for uh, an office for 400 people, uh, will be open in March. Uh, Horgan's Key is on site. Um, Penrose Dock is on site as well, clearance works happening there. The Penrose Dock is scheduled for May 2000, uh, and, where are we at? 2020. Um, and actually conservative estimate is that there'll be 5,000 extra people in the next two to three years. Um, to be honest, there'll be a little bit more, but uh, you can see this, this, the scale of work that's going on in office developments. Public realm investment, um, Harley Street Bridge is, I think, the next May of next year. Uh, you can see work ongoing there, that's pedestrian and cycle bridge. I see Fargus Gleeson here, um, who's been in charge of St. Patrick's Bridge, uh, with funding from TII, uh, there's 1.2 million invested in the preservation and uh, uh, conservation of St. Patrick's Bridge. So that'll be finished very soon. Uh, Marsons Island is obviously delayed, probably people are familiar with that, with that project. Uh, Transport for Cork, I think Shane was around there earlier, Shane, Shane is involved in that. Uh, there's been several million invested, particularly around the Middle Parish uh, area, in new public realm, new lighting there. Um, and obviously there was an element of the Patrick's uh, the Patrick Street bus corridor as part of that as well. Uh, Marina Park to be on site early in the new year, that's a major investment uh, in a multi-million euro investment in the park along the marina. That'll bookend, we'll have Fitzgerald's Park on one side and we'll have the Marina Park on the other side. Tourism and Heritage, uh, maybe a lot of you have already been to um, Nana Naval Place, I suppose the picture doesn't do, do it justice really. Uh, massive development de uh, developed by the order up there, all private money, um, but developed by the order themselves. Uh, if you get a chance to go up to see it, it's, it's probably one of the best tourism developments in many years in Cork. Um, and it's community groups, it's, it's an education project, it's a heritage project, it's a tourism project. Education, we have a number of, uh, I suppose, education institutes moving into the city centre, which brings new vibrancy. Uh, CIT have moved in on Grand Parade, uh, uh, the Art and Design School. Uh, UCC only last week opened across the way their executive business program uh, and they're looking to move more their whole um, business school into, into the city centre. School of Architecture opened in September on Douglas Street bringing 150 students into that and again being more vibrancy to, vibrancy to an up and coming street. Uh, recreation I mentioned uh, Marina Park uh, and also there's, there's some work ongoing on Chamor Valley Park as well. Student accommodation, um, again, you probably, a lot of you probably involved in this, there's no shortage of student accommodation being built. Uh, we estimate around 1,000 bed spaces are currently under construction around the city. Um, and hopefully that will free up some of the residential accommodation as well. 
retail, uh, in recent times, the capital was developed, uh, and also the facade there that's, um, that's been occupied since that picture was taken. Uh, 83 to 85 was redeveloped. I don't know if you remember that, it used to be an easy and a small cafe. Uh, there were three units were put together, and, and the upper floors are being used now as well. And I suppose they've done a really good job in, in keeping the facade there as well. Uh, having said that, uh, and, and obviously the Victoria Hotel is, has planning locally for um, for retail development that's been appealed. But having said all that, and Lorca will talk about in some of the challenges, retail is massively challenged in, in Cork and Ireland and globally uh, in terms of consumer habits and so on, and change of uses and consumer patterns. Culture and sport, um, in the last year there's been a million invested in four arts venues, half by the council and half by the Department of Arts. Uh, the event centre, people are familiar with that story. Um, Parky Heave is developed, and the Crawford in the new National Development Plan is um, aimed to get 22 million euros invested in the next seven years in that. Um, we're lucky with the cultural and arts scene in Cork. Um, about six months ago or nine months ago, um, in the EU monitor um, voted Cork uh, most culturally vibrant in small and medium cities, and that isn't one of the awards that you buy in, so on. that was uh, independently verified with 30 different criteria. So we're looking with that that um, brings the vibrancy. I'm going to talk about some of the people um, events and the place making stuff now. And I just show you this. This was put together by um, we've done a lot of work with master students in CIT on another customer service project. And they came together with this slide, so I use it a lot. Um, I suppose the model we're working on at a local level, at a street level, um, or at a neighbourhood level, uh, is really around developing that sense of community, uh, getting people to work together who may not necessarily have worked together in the past and trying to develop those relationships and trying to create that visitor experience on the street. Uh, the next slide, I just picked these three images, I, I love these three images, it's a completely different event um, that happened during the year, um, but for a variety of reasons, it all involves people working together. Uh, the way people are probably familiar with the long table dinner, uh, it's been held three times now, it involves a number of restaurants, this year 10, 10 different restaurants working together. Uh, that's obviously from last, from last year, not this year's one, but it's, I thought the image was really comes across really well. Uh, 400 people enjoying themselves on the night, same pin bars in the background, trees and so on. Um, so that involved people working together. It's, it's, um, it was just a huge event about Cork on the map, really. The top left, uh, or top right, is, uh, the top left as you, as you see it is uh, Douglas Street. They've had an autumn fest for two years uh, at the end of September. So that's the picture from last time. Again, the street was closed off. All that was organised by the local businesses and the local <coughs> community. Uh, the council and guardians had helped facilitate, but it's all organised locally. I suppose that's the key thing we're trying to get across here. And the last image, uh, I just, I, again, it's one of those great images I find of Cork that was all organised locally. It's a very organic event. That's uh, yoga on the boardwalk, organised very much locally. The cafe is involved as well. But it happens, happened all summer. Um, it's one of those things, if you saw that when you were abroad, you take a picture and you send it and you say, Jesus, look what's happening over here. But that's happening in Cork. There's obviously yoga in, in, the, um, in Fitzgerald's Park, much bigger and so, and so on. But in terms of city centre, you know, that type of image, I think, is, is the, the, kind of the city we're trying to develop. I talked about the big capital projects. I'm going to talk about some of the small um, capital projects now uh, that, again, in, in, help some of the place making we're talking about. Uh, the one at the fountain, uh, the, we talked about the built heritage and St. Patrick's Bridge being developed, but the um, Barrett Fountain was refurbished earlier this year, uh, finished in around September, and it was also lit up as part of that by our planting machinery team. Um, and again, I suppose we've, in the last few years, we've refurbished um, Fort Matthew statue, uh, the National Monument, and um, this, so it's, it's part of maintaining our, I suppose, our built heritage is part of our unique selling point. Um, and that can be turned different colours depending on, like last night it was turned purple for National Disability, purple light up there. Um, and I saw a lot of people taking selfies and so on again. Um, the right is across the way, it was, that's JCD bought at an event, right, have moved in. The reason I put it there is around the lighting. Um, I thought the lighting job is, is really impressive. And it's when we're trying to create that kind of necklace of uh, lighting, especially on key features, key stark features around. Uh, so it really shows, it's, 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 I think it really shows up that building at night. The bottom picture, uh, the Shannon picture, is uh, O'Connell Square. It was a small project done, put together with uh, the local group Shannon Area Renewal Association. They're a very vibrant group, active in Shannon. 
Uh, so they would have worked with the council, um, the roads team and the area champion and uh, our tourism head, Joe, to work to develop that plaza and involve taking out a little bit of parking, uh, put in some seating, uh, put in some planting, um, and it, I suppose it, it creates that, uh, it's just a much better public space there. And the Firk and Crane around the corner has opened up their space further as well. They put some glass into their building. Um, and the right, uh, their examples are buildings that have been painted through the better, uh, sorry, the, our painting grant scheme. The council's had a painting grant scheme for the last six years. Um, it provides 50, up to 50% of the funding towards um, the painting in designated areas. We've moved that around the city centre. Uh, this year it's in South Parish and Shandon. And both those buildings have availed it in, in recent years, and both have won uh, Better Building Awards since then. We won a Better Building Awards in conjunction with the CBA. I just put an example of street art. Um, um, I know Kevin's going to talk, talk about Gales People later on. We had, um, as part of the Cork Evolve series, which Larkin will talk about, uh, Alison Dutois from um, Gales People was over recently, and I brought her on a tour for, for the city centre for two hours. and. It was the street art that she was taken by. Um, obviously, the buildings are great, but so uh, I suppose these are great examples. There's lots of examples around the, around the city. I just picked one, Tobin Street, uh, which is done by a local artist, Peter Martin. Uh, again, a, low, a small alleyway, could be anything, but it's, it really enhances that street, and Soho would have um, funded that. Uh, one that we commissioned recently was, um, we were voted Europe's friendly city with, by Condé Nast, so, that's on the way in as you come in uh, from Lower Grammar Road and Water Street. Uh, just one of the many traffic boxes, uh, that's the one of the Mad About Cork tra tra traffic boxes. Uh, I, just, I think there's one 50 or 60 done. Again, you see a lot of people just uh, that creates that sense of place around Cork. Some are very humorous, some, talk, some talking about the history. So history, humor, and heritage is, is, is the theme really of a lot of those. And the other one, that's the back of the public toilets. Could be anything. It's uh, a mural that was commissioned by the library service. Uh, just three other projects we're going to talk about. Uh, customer service charter that we've been working with the City Centre Forum, which is an operation group of um, the City Centre Partnership. So for the last uh, year, 18 months, been working, really led by two, uh, the general manager of Pennies and Joan from Pipes and Scribes, to develop customer service as a, a unique selling point in the City Centre. So uh, we've, had, we've piloted a training programme in conjunction with the local enterprise office. Um, so we think um, there's a lot of energy behind that particular one. I know Kevin's going to talk about parklets. Um, that's just an example of parking day. Uh, people might be familiar with parking day where parking spaces are turned into parks. So that was a mindfulness garden put together on Douglas Street by um, Justine in the flower shop. Um, we'd hope this year, we've done that a, few, a couple of years, just one day, but we'd hope to develop a parklet if we can get agreement locally and get, uh, get it managed locally, and maybe a six month parklet next year. Um, and the final corner there, Denise's kids. I see Denise over there. There, 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 there. Denise's kids are always brought out for photo, photo shots. Um, we've done a thing called over in October. We did it two years ago, and we did it this year. People may be familiar with it. It's around promoting different uses of, of public spaces and more inclusive public spaces. So we had a number of events. Uh, Kevin's going to talk about the Marina Park. We closed. We did some work in Emmett Place. Uh, and Denise was act very active in all of those, and particularly in Red Abbey, where there was another event uh, last. There was a craft fair on. Uh, Saturday was it, and there was another one oh, during Auburn October. So it's again about using un underutilized public spaces. And my final slide before I hand over to Larkin, um, I mentioned earlier about marketing. So these are just some of the marketing issues. Uh, you see Stevie G, for people who are familiar, up in the top uh, there with the girls on the bike. Um, the, we received funding from uh, National Transport Agency uh, authorities sorry, um, early in the year to, to run a major campaign. People may have seen Stevie's video in the uh, in the cinema, it was on, uh, online. Uh, it was it was on radio. It was lots of it was a whole campaign for three months. Um, that was obviously in support of the um, passenger bus bus corridor coming back in. Uh, mm -hmm. On the right, that's the drums of Runday. We tried to create some more events on on Patrick Street where we where possible. Um, bottom one there is uh, Patrick Street. There's a, um, a collage of images from Culture Night. Uh, Norman Street. Sorry, I should just say Norman Street. Uh, Normally, so the group there has really tried to develop culture night as their night. Uh, for the last two years, they've run a number of events and drawn, drawn a huge number of people down there. Again, that's organised locally. The council helps facilitate, but that's organised locally. Uh, Sapporo Street is another example. Um, Lark will talk about how we've divided the city centre into different neighbourhoods or quarters. Uh, that's uh, the Victorian quarter, they're very active. Um, 
So that was we did that as part of uh, an initiative we have called Feel Good Friday, where um, all the traders came out on the street, <coughs> Sapphire Street. They had, they gave out free food and we had some um, animation on the street. I'll hand you over to Larkin, who will uh, look after some of the structures. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'll just give you a little bit more background on the structures behind, both internally and externally, that um, have, I suppose, helped to maybe shine a better light on the city centre and uh, um, improvements that have taken place and uh, also to make sure that the focus stays on, on regenerating the city centre in changing times as well. Um, so just um, on your left hand side you'll see the image of, of uh, the revitalised, uh, the re revitalisation of quarters or areas in the city centre. There's six, the Shandon North Main Street, uh, McCurtain Street, the heart of the city uh, centre, South Mall and Grand Parade we, we group together and South Parish. Um, overall, the population of the city centre um, in the 2016 census is about 15,000 population. Um, it's extremely walkable from east to west, 15 minutes. And in terms of population growth, there's actually been a 20% growth in population in the city centre um, compared to 5.4% um, growth in the city at, uh, in large. So that's a, it'll tell you the attractiveness as a place to live. And yet we haven't had any substantial new residential uh, de developments within that period. So there's a huge amount of regeneration uh, of the existing housing stock that, that's taken place within that period. And there's a huge one for people to live in the city centre as well. Um, so on the right hand side you see the structures that are in place on the back of the city centre strategy um, being implemented. So the city centre strategy was adopted in 2014. Um, it really was a response to increased vacancy and dereliction in the city centre um, and the need for change in terms of uh, the management of the, of the city centre and to engage with, with, with stakeholders outside of, of this building. Um, it's still relevant now in terms of changing times, even though there's a turnaround in terms of economic circumstances with the extended boundary coming uh, into play next year as well. There's a need to retain a focus on the city centre. It's easy to start looking at edge sites and edge development, but the, the city centre as, as the heart of the city region is, is absolutely crucial. And some of these structures um, help shine a, a light on that as well. So the city centre steering group is an internal group in here. Um, it's uh, basically a, the senior management group uh, with the city planner and city architect, uh, the head of finance, um, and myself and Paul also sit on it. Um, so that helps to drive an agenda internally in terms of different sections within the council focusing just on city centre issues. We'd meet every six weeks. Uh, there's an agenda there um, that's quite detailed that will go on for about an hour and a half um, and it tries to respond to an annual action plan that we develop uh, each year to try and drive new initiatives for the city centre uh, and try and collaborate as well. And part of that collaboration is, is the core group which, which Paul would uh, coordinate and that's uh, city centre stakeholder groups. Uh, so you've got uh, the Garda Siakana, you've got the hotel group, um, you've got um, Bosseran, that's what I'm missing there, Paul. Yeah, hospitality. Hospitality yeah, group, uh, some councillors on it as well. So it's really a city centre stakeholder mix uh, to, to make sure that it's not just an internal group that are coming up with ideas or trying to implement ideas, um, that it, it, there's a city representation there as well. Uh, beyond that, the City Centre Forum tries to come up with practical ideas out of that, it would be nearly a subgroup of core. Uh, the Area Champions are a director from each of the directorates in here and a planner um, that would look at each city area and try and engage with the communities that are there, whether they be a, a business community or a resident community, um, and try and, um, I suppose, facilitate new ideas uh, at a neighbourhood level. Um, and the City Centre Coordinator role, Paul's role, would have come out of the, the strategy as well. Um, that's a picture of the city centre's um, steering group, it's a little bit old, um, and the city centre partnership group, which is the stakeholder group. Um, to give you an idea of um, maybe at a sub level, one of those quarters, uh, the South Parish um, area, which uh, would have a population of about 5,000 people um, out of the 15,000 population that's there. So when you look at the city centre, it's, it's actually polarised. Shandon have a population about 5,000 and, and, and uh, South Parish about 5,000. The centre has, has a lot more capacity. 
but in terms of city centre, it's it's very comparable to Edinburgh. Um, Edinburgh is a city centre with the same radius, of about one kilometre, has a population of about 12,000. Uh, it's seen about 25% increase over the last 10 years. Cardiff's population is about 12,000 as well. Um, Liverpool's slightly higher. Belfast is less than 5,000 population. So in terms of a dense residential area and a livable, vibrant area, Cork City Centre favours well, but within the districts there's there's uh, variations. South Parish has said about a population of 5,000, but 500 businesses, uh, 4,000 employees, uh, very vibrant, uh, very engaged over the last few years, uh, particularly uh, some of the street groups and business groups um, responding to initially anti-social behaviour and then building on that and, and trying to look at initiatives to uh, shine a light on their areas and their streets considering maybe that they're, they're on the verge of the city centre and not part of the city centre island. Um, so there's, we've had some good examples of things that have happened there, Denise here, um, through Healthy Cities, Healthy City Coordinator and, and greening projects that have, uh, greening for health projects that have been sustained over the last, over a year and a half. Um, so looking at, you know, planting boxes, but um, also longer term in terms of initiatives that engage with the, with the community. Um, uh, there's the, the, the food forest, um, um, on um, Summerhill South um, and, and just trying to look at the squares within the area as well in terms of how to reuse those Rad Red Abbey Square and um, in terms of how to, to bring more greening into a, an area that's very very dense but has very few green spaces and the ones that are there are, are underperforming. Um, so that's an example of one of the quarters. I'll just talk you th through a few of the key challenges. So Paul has highlighted some of the the, uh, the positive stuff that, that's there, but there are there are a number of, of, of big challenges um, in terms of revitalising the city centre. Retail and the future of retail is something that's heavily being debated, and you know some of the larger um, chains and, and well-known stores that we know in the UK are under pressure. Um, we've got the pressure from online, where in the UK they predicted that, that online will, will, will increase 30% by 2022. Um, so that's a massive spend on, on, on a daily basis. Um, in Ireland, there was a PayPal report recently that said we were about 12% online spend, um, but it, it's a doubling every year. It's a doubling increase every year. So there's rapid change in, in uh, how people experience or how people want to shop and, and what they want to experience when they come into a town centre. That's reflected, I suppose, in a number of coffee shops and other uses that are replacing traditional uh, retail areas. But the challenge is there because when we look at vacancy, uh, it's, it's been uh, at a steady level since 2014 uh, and that's economic recovery hasn't happened in terms of retail even though we've had some uh, big applications and um, there's still a steady, le steady level of vacancy there so it, it, I suppose there's a policy decision to be made in terms of how we respond to that um, are retail cores retail cores anymore or are they more, do we have to reconsider things and there's certainly learnings we can get from the UK on, on how different city centres have uh, have adapted and changed uh, and not just being a retail heart. Um, flood defence is one that's obviously been in, in very highly debated in the city over the last number of years. Um, it's not going away, there has to be a response to it. Um, what that is, there's no harm, it, 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 having the debate is all part of that process. Um, but the solution needs to be there as well, and viable solutions. Um, uh, in terms of uh, dereliction and uh, uh, in terms of our process internally, we have a derelict sites register. Um, there's over 97 um, properties on that register. Engaging with owners and trying to find out who the owners are is absolutely central to that. Um, and trying to encourage them to do something with the building um, before we actually activate the process has, has, has helped a lot um, over the last couple of years um, but uh, it, it's still something that we need to, to push and challenge in the city centre. Um, transport is some exciting times ahead in terms of city centre implementation of 200 million identified for bus connects uh, to try and increase uh, PT use within the city centre. The MPF long term is looking at uh, the LRT route and it's something that we'll have to identify in terms of a route selection as part of the next city development plan. And um, so that's a huge challenge as well, um, particularly in terms of delivering something that stacks up along with the docklands and trying to spread a number of uses across the city um, and not 
take away from the fact that the city sh centre should always um, act as the healthy heart of both the city and the region. Um, so it's something we're working with a number of consultants on in terms of looking at different uses spread across the city. Um, in terms of accommodation, as I said, there's a huge spread in terms of the neighbourhoods, the, the amount of accommodation and uh, the amount of people living in the city centre. The capacity, particularly at, at first floor level in, in, in the city centre <coughs> island, is massive. Uh, trying to overcome that in terms of the restrictions, in, in terms of building regulations, there's been some changes to the planning regulations and exemptions to try and help that. Uh, but trying to coordinate that and give people confidence that they can invest in the, in the heart of the city. There's demand there, there's no doubt about it but maybe there's a fear there and there's a scalability issue in terms of um, who, who is willing to take on these more difficult challenges of, of, uh, of looking out for floor uses that are vacant uh, and converting them into habitable uh, living areas. One of the in initiatives I'd like to highlight, if you haven't heard of it, is the Living City uh, Initiative. It's a national region, um, tax incentive to incentivize urban regeneration. Um, it, there's a, I think there's roughly 35, 36 applications, successful applications that have been done in Cork City Centre. Um, it, it, it looks at giving substantial tax relief over the course of, of um, uh, a person's employment um, on the back of uh, investing in, in, in uh, regenerating an area or a property um, into living accommodation, both as a landlord um, and as, uh, as an owner. Um, Another massive challenge is public realm improvements. Uh, Patrick Street has, has uh, obviously experienced the Beck Alley um, regeneration in 2014. Um, it's, it's been more staggered since then. Uh, Barrick Street is, uh, was over 1.3 million spent on, on Barrick Street in 2013. Um, slowly, you'll see the bottom of Barrick Street is starting to regenerate. Maybe the top half has, has, has longer to come. Uh, but life has definitely come back into the lower half of Barrick Street on the back of that and it's, it's, it's definitely a more pleasant environment to walk down. Uh, O'Connell Square, if you haven't been up there recently, there's um, some uh, new paving and, and seating gone in around Firkin and Firkin have responded with the, with the lovely job that they've done on glazing the outside of the building as well to try and get that integration between building and space. Uh, but when we look at the next challenges in city centre movement strategy, rolling out uh, improvements. You look at 1920s McCurtain Street, uh, where it was, and you look at it in 2018, and you wonder if the straight line progression isn't always the way. Uh, we see trams, we see wide footpaths, we see canopies, we see active streets, and now we see uh, in the heart of the city centre, one of the most thriving areas of the city centre, McCurtain Street, um, you see dominated by cars. So getting over that and getting our mindset beyond that is also very, very important. I suppose as part of that, it's, it's, it's about having the conversations um, and making sure the city centre is part of a focused um, approach, both internally and externally. And part of that was the, a series of talks on the Cork uh, conversations, talking about different issues of housing and urban regeneration, placemaking, um, and, and getting experts in and inviting people to come along to talk about it in an open way and to learn about how it's done. Um, the Academy of Urbanism event happened in June. Uh, we had 250 urbanists from Ireland, UK and Europe um, who were here for four days. A uh, fantastic event, a fantastic learning experience uh, and also in terms of creating networks uh, where we can learn from the best in terms of regeneration projects in Bilbao and Hafen City, Amsterdam. These connections need to be built up. Um, so that was, it was, it was a very positive um, event and we've had the Academy over since giving us feedback on what they thought the Cork needs to learn uh, to, to progress into the future um, and that's something that we'll feed into the next city plan as well. Uh, the Cork Evolve series is probably, um, that was ongoing as well, it's, it's a similar, yes, similar, similar, similar and um, there was one on housing actually yeah, and different models of housing and certainly housing is, is a major challenge. So that's just a, f a sort of run through I suppose of, of um, how we're trying to keep a focus on the city centre both internally and externally. Um, I know Paul is running off, but if you have a couple of questions after Kevin's talk, um, I'll try and I'll try and answer them for you. Thanks very much.
I plan to talk for about 40 minutes. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thanks. I feel like I've been left into the good room, actually, <laughs> because I've never been here. Um, so just um, just a brief introduction. So I, I suppose I'm background as an urban planner. I had a, when I finished Queen's in 2005, I had a happy kind of year and a half here in Cork City Council as a, in, in Lorcan's team and Breach's team. Um, I was, wanted to go to Australia, went there. And uh, I accidentally fell, fell into transport planning. I uh, took a phone call from a recruitment agent who said, uh, do you do referrals? No idea what they were. Said yes, turned up. Uh, there was no interview, I was already in the job. So I, I fall, and that, that's pretty much my life, to be honest, but uh, I've just fallen into, into jobs. So I also, from there, I went to Auckland, where I was working local area plans. Uh, came back here September 2008, height of the crash. So I had to, had to hot foot it across the sea. Um, so quick. I suppose a quick kind of uh, introduction. So I've worked in three uh, different London boroughs at this stage. Uh, I started in Waltham Forest up in there. You can see North East London there. Uh, you can see what's been in the news in the last couple of weeks. I think even in, in the paper series in Mini Holland, uh, the borough received 30 million um, funding from Cycling Vision. That is not, I can't claim any credit for that. Um, I did go to a councillor. I left in 2012. I went to the council, a kind of watered down version of that. Uh, he, was, he was more lukewarm about it, but um, 30 million quid will change a lot of hearts and minds. So, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, from there I moved to Hackney, where as a senior transport planner I took a risk. I, I left a full-time job in Waltham Forest, but Hackney was seen as the, it was the, 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 the most innovative borough in sustainable transport, and I really wanted to go there. So I took a kind of short-term contract, and luckily enough uh, it, it worked out, and I managed to, to stay um, full-time. So uh, there, they see themselves. That there's very different kind of political pressure on there. They see themselves as the head of sustainable transport. So all councils would constantly on. So we, we the highest cycling rates. If let's say Kingston or, or Richmond, or seem to be you know in the year figures, they would they seem to be getting closer, catching up. They wanted to know why we were falling behind. Um, very very heavy bus use. No tube, funny enough, in Hackney. And they see themselves in, in kind of leaders in what we call filtered permeability. So cul de sacs, but allowed pedestrian cyclists through. Be an easy way to do it. And they moved on to what they call uh, neighbourhoods of the future in lower, lower emission neighbourhoods. Um, my final year in London, I was asked to uh, go to work for Sodic to write something called a curbside strategy. Uh, that's kind of a fancy way of saying looking at the space that people normally consider for car parking. Um, but the, in, in the context of a you know a growing a, a growing kind of a, a huge a growing population and economy, um, very big mix areas. You had some of the I suppose real working class areas, the Haygate Estate, and then you had the kind of Village Green Preservation Site in Dulwich. So very different challenges there. I typically I, one of the reasons I wanted to show this map as well because most of the inner London boroughs have a population close to what Cork is expecting 2040. So the challenges that they're facing at the moment are very, very relevant to us at the moment. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit of kind of change in all the context, the change of context of transport planning. So when I started, it was all about, you know, getting access to Olympic Park, you know, getting access to jobs, re regeneration, how, you know, but then it changed because it, it, local authorities have responsibility for public health uh, from 2013. And air quality for was started becoming more of an issue. And you can see in the top left, that's the map of London, that's the nitrogen dioxide levels. And a big consequence of that is that people die they have, yeah, respiratory diseases. Uh, the, other, the other big public health issue was uh, people, basically school kids, but you know, us in general being overweight. 
Um, and you can see, I'm just looking through the a, a, internet this morning to see if I could find a Cork relevance. There's one, there's an article there from the Evening Echo, and you can see that the, I, like the kids have need, no need adult size uniforms. Uh, and I think it's a public health uh, doctor from UCC um, I'd, I'd saying it would be beneficial to link all the Cork towns with, with cycle lanes. So I, I just found that interesting. Uh, you can see as well, like, children are, or, there are times in London, particularly last week, so they're giving out um, masks to kids uh, that, to walk to school. Also, they're banning them from playing at, at lunchtime in certain, certain really uh, uh, poor air quality areas. Um, so this policy response, I'm quite proud of this. So we, we, I was asked for a transport strategy in Hackney, and we did the usual. We did, we did a walking, cycling one. We did public transport, road safety. We also did something called a livable neighbourhoods plan, which is on the, the top left. And that had some of the stuff that I was talking about, the lower emission neighbourhoods and the filtered permeability. Um, I mentioned the curbside strategy, and that looked at you know the space, the car parking space. Uh, how can we turn it? Well, we need street trees, we need cycle lanes, we need to bus lanes, we need to move people more more efficiently and healthier and, and cleaner. And then at the time, so about a few months later, when I was writing that, the Transport for London brought out Healthy Streets for London, a really really useful document. And this is a, you can see the, the benefits of walking and cycling. And there, everything from diabetes to depression, heart disease, uh, and, and certain types of cancers. So you can see that in top left, if each Londoner, if walked a site for 20 minutes a day, would save 1.7 billion to NHS. I don't know the equivalent to, to Ireland, but clearly you know, we, we spend a lot of money on health and uh, not preventative causes, but obviously treating people. A uh, very simple exercise I do with lecturing in UCC. I asked the, the students there, there's three, uh, three different streets in Cork City. I asked them to look at Oliver Plunkett Street. I asked them to look at Douglas Street. And I asked them to look at, uh, what's the third one? North Main Street. And the sim 12 simple criteria in a healthy streets document, you can see them, you know, clean air, is it easy to cross? Is there, you know, is it noisy? Do, do people feel safe there? And I asked the kids, I asked the, not kids, sorry, I asked the students, I see a couple of them here, um, they, I asked the students to rate them simply and, and you know, it was very interesting results because some of them aren't from Cork, they've, they've just seen it, you know, first impressions, fresh eyes, the street, and essentially Oliver Plunkett Street obviously ranks very highly there, there's a lack of seating there, which is which pointed out by students, some very interesting observations, both North Main Street and Douglas Street would fail um, just on, on that simple exercise. Uh, again, kick to the curb. So you know, if anyone watches Match Today too, they do this. They're too good, too bad. Uh, this is four bad. And um, so it's a mix of, of of London, obviously, and Cork. So if we're asking people to walk and cycle, we're wondering why they can't do it. We can look. We don't prioritise the space. Top left is opposite Borough Market. There's hundreds of thousands of people who visit that every year. And you can see there's people you know, forced to walk on on the footpath because the the footpaths aren't wide enough. Uh, top right is Ballin Temple. I walk, try and walk my kids to school, nursery. If I'm walking down there with a buggy, and that, like one of us has to hit the road, so it's it's, it's clearly not safe to do it. Uh, the bottom left is a uh, just Cork cycling campaign. They have run a, ca a campaign out in Ballin College. Ask the guards, the you know the, these people parked outside. Is it close to column? I think. Um, and I think hopefully there's, there seems to be a bit of action in this. And even kind of so-called sustainable transport measures, you can see there's an electric vehicle charge point in the bottom. This is outside my office in, in Southwark. That, that's eating into the footpath as well. So they, like, clearly you know, the, the, there's a good way to do that in a bad way. That's, that's obviously a bad way of doing it. Um, I would argue we can't, we absolutely cannot create livable neighbourhoods and we have to tackle parking. There's absolutely no such thing as free parking. Uh, don't take my word for it. This comes from an uh, economist, Donald Shoup, uh, whose name the book is The High Cost of Free Parking. And essentially, the, there's an opportunity cost to, to parking. If we're looking at, let's say, off street park, we're looking at apartments, and a developer has to put in, has to meet parking requirements, well, what will happen is he'll provide less housing. And they'll provide less housing, or they, you know, there'll, there'll be less activity there. If we're looking at on street, um, as I say, the, the, this is from the 60s in Westminster, where you can see in the, on the far left it was free initially, and you can see people double parked. You know, as we've seen, we've seen that around. It's an uncommon sight there. Since they started charging a little bit, it kind of regulated itself and increased the uh, it, uh, the parking by four. And you can see that space freed up, 
and that space is what we can play with as an urban design, it's where you can get in your bus and so on. Um, we know, we don't know what will happen with Brexit, but clearly the, the economy of Westminster didn't suffer over the last four, four decades. The other thing to say about parking charges, and again, if I'm looking at Ormond Street, if I'm looking at you know, residential areas around the, around the city that have uncontrolled parking, if you start charging for those, if you start to pay you know, reasonable fee for on-street parking, Obviously, it's managed, but you, the, the revenue generated from that can be used to fund, you know, street trees and, and cycle lanes and uh, safer crossing facilities, wherever it happens to be. Um, so I suppose it, 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 what, a big part of my job over there is I'd, I'd manage a couple of public realm schemes, but also we're trying to, you know, try and get this through. And as, as you see from the panel ban, you can see from everything, it's quite difficult to do it. These are from uh, the top left one is, is from Hackney. This is a Orthodox Jewish community in Hackney who. Funny enough, actually the opposite of Patrick Street, they protested against buses. We removed buses on this. It was quite, you can see it's called narrow way for a reason. They, they were 100 buses flying down. We pedestrianised it and just re redirected buses. And the other three are from Walton Forest as part of that mini Holland scheme. Uh, so certainly they, you can see the, the top right is quite quite explicit. The Irish guy actually owned, owned this. Whenever we'd go up and look at the site, he's the shout, shout out, you see, ruined the place. Um, and you can see they, they formed a, a coffin going through the Walpstow village, you know, death, death to the, the you know, retail. And you can see it obviously giving, giving more of the Forest Council a thumbs down there, give them a handy picture for the paper. But so I suppose one thing, so, you know, if we're in Cork or we're, or we're in London and say, oh, look at Amsterdam, Amsterdam's fantastic, or, you know, Germany or wherever it happens to be, it's like, oh, yeah, that's okay for them. In London, it was like, well, they're only kind of small, small sized cities, so you know, what, what's Amsterdam got to do with London? So we said, okay, we'll pick a global city. Here's New York. And it's, it's, so some people will be familiar with the work of Janet Sadi Khan, uh, who introduced the kind of concept of street trials and doing, you know, doing stuff kind of, you know, kind of suck and see. Let's, you know, put out these temporary measures, see how they go. If they fail, no problem. We just take it back out and put it back the way it was. If they succeed, great. Let's go. We we'll go ahead. We won't. We won't have spent in order of you know, millions of pounds on a failed project. So we'll try this. And this is people will be familiar with. This is the Times Square so it's pedestrianised scheme there. And I, it's, I mean, it's that's over ten years ago. It's been filled in since. It's been improved, I should say. Uh, it's what I use that concept. Of, this is Regent's Row in uh, Hackney. Alongside Regents Canal, uh, most people would say, "Yeah, I prefer that area on the bottom right." Uh, unfortunately, those people don't tend to write into the council. You know, so they're they come out, get on with it already. Crowd will say, uh, "People who don't want it will also will always be more vocal, more vociferous." Um, so I suppose there was a lot, a lot of complaints to this. When I, I did, did lots of consultation, we did lots of leaflet drops, and ultimately what resolved it was. We said, I promise we'll do an 18-month street trial under what was called an experimental traffic order. Uh, we also got the residents involved. They maintained some of the planters along there, and they had a sense of ownership of the scheme. And funny enough, we, I actually went back after six months perfectly happy. The, the biggest thing they actually found was the noise, because what, what cars were doing were rat running along here, a bit like the marina, for example. Uh, can we try more in Cork? This is uh, this is a fairly famous uh, light segregated uh, trial um, cycle scheme in, in Camden. So the cost of this, you can see, it's kind of use of planters and it's use of uh, what they call orchids. Funny enough, the, the things on the, on the bottom, uh, for about forty grand, they actually ripped out a, a cycle track that wasn't working. They've got on the opposite side is kind of parking protected areas. They're certainly trying to get that in in Dublin at the moment in Fitzwilliam Street. Uh, hasn't been near there yet, and this might be a way for me to, to kind of gain acceptance for it. But um, this this was this work this scheme worked a treat. It's uh, since since this happened, they've gone back, they've extended the route, and they've put it in with more uh, with proper segregated lanes. This is one of my favourites, the cheapest thing you could do: cycle parking. Anyone familiar with east of the GPO in, in Cork City will know it's a big cycle parking problem. You've uh, uh, cycles, um, I suppose, latched onto to street lights. They're blocking footpaths. They're, you know. So what we did in Hackney was we we had five of these on the go, and we used to move them around the borough every six weeks. And if they were popular, we then went back and we put in permanent cycle parking. 
or in many cases actually what happened is cafe owners or, or businesses said no we can we please keep this so we said fine you can pay for the the installation and the, we went to, they went to install so this one is in shoreditch and the idea of the car bike port you can see it's, it's supposed to be like 10 bikes equal to one car so it's supposed to send a kind of strong sustainability measure uh, message but in actual fact you can see there's what, about 15 16 bikes attached to that and that, that's common for, for all over the, the borough play streets very very effective uh, school kids are, are, are no longer been able to play outside the, their homes they have to be driven to parks they have to be, uh, this is a very simple resident-led scheme. Uh, council facilitated it. You can see what they've done. They've closed off the road for an hour or two each. Uh, you know, I think it was worked about kind of one, at least one day a month. It was resident-led. You can see their views. That's a wheelie bin. They just put a you know temporary road closure across it. Phenomenally successful. They're they're all over the board and they've extended. The first one was in Bristol. Uh, we we like we did a lot of things in Hackney. We stole it from somewhere else. Um, and it's, it's, it's rolled out across, uh, across many, many other London boroughs. School streets, who we all know about the school run, uh, how problematic it is. Um, this is the start is part of an EU project called EU Stars. And what they effectively do is they close the road immediately outside the school for an hour uh, for, the, I suppose, the morning drop-off period and, and the collection period. And you can see what happens there is kids take over they've got bikes to do it so we there's plenty of there's plenty of streets in cork that you know outside schools that we know to have have issues with this and there's safety i mean if people uh a big problem with the pickup obviously they're parking footpaths but they're also leaving the engine running there's, there's pollution on this uh, what's called idling happy park they're very proud of this one again stolen we had uh, it was a richard florida here from the academy of urbanism earlier this year we used to read what his paper, I think it was City Lab website, and I'd seen, seen these pop up in San Francisco uh, and Chicago, and I said, well, I really wanted to do it. So luckily, again, the political support was there. So this was a joint venture with Sustrans and Cycle, who, who also manufactured the last uh, the car bike port. What I wanted to do is kind of have something maybe a bit temporary, maybe move around if needed be, but something a little bit more permanent than, than a, a normal parking day one. So we print cycle parking said if nothing else people will use the cycle parking but we print we also print you can see some seating and planting and this is a cafe that opened up uh, not because of it, it was absolutely a happy coincidence and what happened is they they when we opened up they, they had their best week's trading because people were making what you call accidental pur purchases they were coming up or they were cycling home say oh i fancy some cheese there's a cycle parking and i'll pop into the shop I might have a coffee uh, if you're looking at inclusive, healthy streets, and you're talking about older, older people in particular, they need, they need public seating. We don't really provide that in Ireland. This was my reason to do it, and also the, you know, this part of the borough was uh, a lack of greenery. We had to move this, probably ironically, to, for it to put in a cycle lane, uh, and, um, but uh, the, the cafe owner never really forgave us and moved to another, another part of the borough. They were, they were just happy to see it. Um, and it's, it's kind of had an impact. They, 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 I've taken this again from City Lab. You can see with the people spots, the parklets, why people do, they generate footfall, they, they help. Um, they, there's more people, what's called stickability, to hang around the street. And this is kind of, it's kind of led to explosions. Looking, but looking at this up last night, one, what the statue in Hackney is, they've let residential streets, people would, would um, ask the council, can I put up, can I take over a parking space? Council might give a grant, and it's about 150. They have to supply a concept. You can see people are doing that all over the borough. They just take this. I think they, they can leave them up for up to six months. Okay, so like that's all very well, you know, London, fantastic, and all that. So the good news is, that I think if I was giving this talk about three years ago, like this would be kind of going over everyone's head, and we can't do it. But we've seen, you know, we, we've had, I think, uh, Douglas Street Festival, Shannon Street Festival. And you showed the long table they're all fantastic they're all you know what's called tactical urbanism they kind of they show that there's more value to the street than just using them for car parking or just for through uh through traffic and um, so a few years ago i don't know if mike is mike here now ah here you go it's a good man uh, so a few of us under kind of a, a twitter an angry twitter group called why we formed out was what if cork and we asked them um, well we want we we, we need it was a quarter block party and we asked paul uh, who was extremely helpful at the time? He said, We were fancy closing a street as part of a quarter block party. What do you think of it? And he was quite supportive. So we, we, we kind of 
didn't entirely know what we were doing. We kind of we we fumbled through, and it turned out quite well. So we did this. We closed street, and you can see it with quarter block party. The the you know, the, the, the uh, Stomp Town Brass, I think they call it. There, uh, yeah. Um, I you see there was kids playing in the street. Uh, you know, we did a guy with balloons, and that, like for that, if people who know that street, there, that isn't only the case. It's fairly kind of non scrappy kind of street, really, with uh, high levels of, of uh, We also held a kind of a civic engagement kind of a workshop, and we invited people in, and like, the usual kind, you know, where do we see the city going in the next five, ten years? And, and now it's, it's obviously taken on. It's much more formal. We've, we've uh, academy of urbanism and core conversations and so. Uh, we talked, uh, touched on parking day again. Cork in Dublin. Uh, the, the Douglas Street one is fantastic, um, and but the city needs to be playful as well. We're we're, we're desperately short of places to, to bring kids in, into the street. It's it's something we need to be mindful of. You know, we we uh, the bottom left is some Krakow. That's going to be a little bit of leftover space. They've just put in like kind of swings on it. Uh, so the marina closure. So um, again, another angry tweet by me, but. Stormophilia happened last year, I think you all remember it. What happened is some of the trees needed to be cut because they're in, they're in uh, poor nick. And it, it, so if you kind of take advantage of that. So we, we um, was, I walked that last week with the kid, or sorry, last year after Stormophilia. It was kind of a beautiful day. And what happened is because the cars weren't allowed down there, there was people walking on the footpath. It was a much calmer, pleasant place to do it. So I said, look, no brainer. Let's go, let's go and do this. So forgot all about it and then Denise, glad she, she's here, so uh, she, she emailed me, she called for ideas for part of Urban in October, so I said great, we'll do that, but uh, the problem with Denise is like, it, you know, giving you Denise an idea is a, a cheese is an action item, so you actually have to go to go through with it, and you have to, <laughs> you can't kind of sit there and sort of admiring your genius, you have to kind of get it mucking and get involved, so um, the idea is that we, we do it for four hours, so get to time with time with the, the Black Rock Market, four Sundays in October, and the, the best part of it was that Cork's fantastic for you know, volunteers. Uh, I was really worried about it. We can see the, the list of people we've had there doing PPN network and had these there's a few people in this room who, who, who've obviously been there. And even Cork Boat Club, they offered to store the equipment for us. So it was a totally fantastic. Uh, we'd support from all the city councillors, to be fair, and also some, you know, I suppose, hopeful councillors. And uh, we didn't do, we did some, a little bit of, um, I suppose, kind of pedestrian counts. You can see we did 2,400 over two, two hour period. That was the second week. Uh, I don't know, I'll try and see if this works, but I suspect it won't, will it? What's that, my tea? <laughs> the points. If you can try and click the first link, please. Okay. Okay. Time out. So hopefully this is 50 <coughs> seconds and I can, I can be quiet for that time and you can watch this otherwise I'll have to you'll have to listen to me for a bit. Oh yeah. Or it just oh yeah. Can you back click? Dodgy music, but uh, So that, you, you've seen that in the clip. These were the pictures. And it's on, I'll zoom on there. Unfortunately, the next week, this is what happened. Went back. 
back to what it was. Um, I've, I think it's the last slide there, just, to, you know, just banning uh, traffic work. This is from the Mini Holland. They released a lot of, uh, a lot of information over the uh, over last couple of years. Uh, if anyone wants to see it, you can go on the website. It's in Joy Walton Forest. And then in the last few weeks, you can see that the traffic fell in it, but actually, you know, the, the uh, retail and stuff like football increased. Uh, the other report to look at, it was in the, again, press the last couple of weeks, the TFL uh, Street Appeal report, and that looks at the, it compares five, uh, compares ten um, town centres where five where they've done public realm stuff, five where they haven't done, and you can see the difference in there, you know, in footfall and increase of activity and uh, uh, value, etc. Okay, so last quote, um, this one, Jan Gell, most people know, would have heard of him. And it's, again, city planning is all of us. It's not just you know, the planners or transport engineers or whatever happens to be. It, it, it involves a lot of civic participation. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Quentin and, and Valerie, to uh, invite me here tonight. Uh, my name is Stefan Koch. I'm the commuter plan manager in UCC, but uh, tonight's talk is uh, not necessarily, let's say, attached to the affiliation to UCC. So it's more kind of a general overview over the city. And uh, as Valerie said uh, at the start, I'm also a member of the Transport and Mobility Forum in Cork and uh, Cork Cycling Campaign. So it's a little bit more broader view of. Uh, of the city. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be, I'm afraid, it's going to be a little bit more kind of theoretic. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is integration of sustainable travel modes for seamless multimodal travel. And uh, I'm very thankful actually for uh, Kevin that in the last slide he showed young Gail. Uh, of course, he crossed my mind immediately when I saw the picture of Times Square, New York, and, and all the rest of it. So, young Gail is really one uh, book to be read. Uh, interesting enough, first book was in 71, I think. He published The uh, Life Between Buildings. And another uh, book that always comes to mind is uh, Jane Jacobs with the uh, death and life of the great American cities from the late 50s, I think, or early 60s. So these things are still valid or being back on the agenda again uh, these days to revitalize our urban cities. So um, that is a little bit the abstract. So what are we talking about? We're talking about sustainable travel modes and how they could better, with better integration, um, form uh, just have a little bit of time there. Yeah, form uh, 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 let's say uh, a better multimodal transport chain. How they can f perform better. How, how an integration of uh, the different transport modes, which today very often still uh, exist on their own um, and are very little integrated, how they could actually help to make the city a better place, a little bit better than it was yesterday, like Young Gale said. And um, for, let's say, you all know it, uh, the projected number of workplaces of uh, population over the next uh, 20 years or so in Cork, there needs to be a change. We, we can't be reliant on the public, uh, on the pri private car use <coughs> to levels or at levels that we have today. And uh, talk about public health, et cetera, et cetera, the figure of 1.7 billion pound that was really impressive. Um, so. What are we talking about? Sustainable travel modes, in the first instance, what comes to mind is walking and cycling as forms of active travel. There is public transport with uh, trams, buses, trains, um, but there is also maybe not the very obvious things like, and if I say sustainable travel to me, it is everything but sitting alone in your private car as a, as a single occupancy car. So it will also then be car sharing, a taxi, ride pooling or paratransit is also called car pooling, bike sharing. So all this kind of, it's, it's a big bucket of flowers actually that can be uh, uh, taken as sustainable travel. So uh, I'm not gonna read this all out, but just the three main parts of sustainable travel modes is walking, of course, it's the most natural way of getting from A to B. It is quite limited in the distance you can cover up to three, four kilometers, of course, maybe a little bit daring, but it is dependent on topography, on physical ability, and also weather, and a bit on the built environment. Cycling is a little bit the same. It's 
even more dependent on physical ability. It is uh, also very weather dependent, and I saw that when I came here tonight. I uh, don't know whether my knees are still wet. And uh, public transport, you can cover longer distances with public transport into the city or within the city, but here the limiting factor is reliability, convenience, information, and of course you're highly reliant on the route network and on timetables. So they all have the pros and cons, and uh, the idea is how to combine them best to actually live up to the full potential in combination with the other mode. Um, so, and I give, I'll be giving some examples here of combinations of integrations, of ways sustainable travel can be improved um, just by combining two or three things which aren't combined yet. So for instance, walking and cycling. Uh, public bike sharing, I don't know if Michael O'Hearn is still around or whether he's already back on his way to Dublin. Um, we're or I'm a big fan of public bike sharing. The Coke bikes, they're the best invention since sliced bread here. And uh, we've seen that in UCC. We started campus bikes three years before. Huge success. And now we have public bike sharing here in Cork. It expands the radius of what you can do with modes of active travel, with cycling and walking tremendously. So a uh, colleague of mine next door in the office, he comes from the Black Rock Road uh, uh, side of town. Uh, it will take him more than half an hour, three quarters of an hour to walk. Now he walks into the city center here, outside city hall, he picks up a Coke bike, cycles the rest. So it expands basically the radius of what you can do tremendously. So what could be uh, ways to improve actually this combination? So an expansion of the bike scheme, that would be a huge potential. It's not broken. Um, if you want to promote this combination with cycling and walking. So the idea is maybe to put extra bike stations at the bottom of the hilly north side and the south side, outside the South Infirmary, before you go up to the Douglas Road, at the bottom of Shandon Street. People come down the hill, take the bike, and go to where they want to go. And uh, that might be a way to uh, actually improve this. E-bikes would be a way to actually bring it up to the south side and the north side. Uh, there's a big scheme that was just launched uh, uh, in Lisbon with electric bikes. Uh, I think it was just last year or this year, earlier this year. Um, the other idea is if you want to have people also doing their weekend shopping, sometimes a cool bike isn't really the best place to carry your weekend shopping, why not have cargo bikes in strategic locations also to be hired out to people, to cool bike users, to do maybe even a house move for students or something like that. So there's a huge potential how this can still be actually expanded. Uh, integration, intramodal integration, public transport. So everybody knows the challenges, I guess, of public transport in Cork. It is the route network. It is a question of information. When is my bus going? Where is it going? Why is it late? Does it run at all at the moment? Inclusion of all transport providers. And here I talk about things like the National Journey Plan. I mean, the NTA is running the National Journey Planner, but I'm pretty sure things or services like the just recently opened um, Cove Connect bus service is not in there. It's, it's mostly the CIE companies. It's Dublin Buses, it's Bus Aaron, it's Ian Rod Aaron. Uh, there should be everything in the National Journey Planner. The same with ticketing. So there should be only one ticket for whatever bus route I take. If I change routes, I have to pay twice on a single ticket here, which is absolutely incomprehensible for me. Uh, if I change from the bus to the train or vice versa, I still can't get a through ticket unless I have a season ticket on the leave card. So there should be an integration in ticketing. Public transport is one thing, actually. It's one black box to the customer. The customer isn't interested in, okay, who's running the buses, who's running the train, who's running the private bus. No, it should be all under one roof and all on one ticket. And the location of Kent Station, I'll come back to that on a later slide. It's not ideal, but it is where it is, and we can't really change that. So there needs to be better connectivity to Kent Station. The bus route network, and now also a question of information. Uh, yeah, the bus route network, there, there was a saying, all roads lead to Rome, and apparently this translates to, Cork, uh, uh, to the Cork situation, all bus routes go to city center. But do all the customers want to go to city center? No. So there is an increasing need for transferring between routes. So there is a certain amount or a growing amount of passengers who hop on a bus, but who need to change a bus, a bus route. In the city center, if you have a single ticket, you need to pay twice. Okay, not really nice. 
uh, you don't really know if your connection is going to work or if it isn't going to work. Uh, is the bus already gone? Uh, make, so make transfers more, as convenient and as reliable as possible. So how could you do that? Especially in late hours when there's not this frequent bus services, you can have secured connections. Say, Statue and Patrick Street, the central bus stop. We have five routes calling there, and they should all call at the same time. And it should be radio operator. Okay, is the 205 there? Yes, the 208 there? Yes, is 203 there? Yes, okay. Now waiting two minutes for people to change, and then we can go. Or where's the 208? Okay, it's still at the, at the red light at Pangle Place. Wait two more minutes. This sort of thing. Uh, or if a bus connection, if a route connection doesn't work, there are public transport operators or transport authorities who offer people a taxi. A guarantee if you are late for our fault, more than 20 minutes, we offer you a taxi. I've taken that a couple of times in Berlin, late night traffic. No problem, no kind of sweating, okay, is the other night bus going to wait? No, if the bus was gone, I took a taxi, I was reimbursed. So this creates more confidence in public transport, even if you have to change routes. And again, don't punish the passenger with an extra fare. A one ticket for one trip covering all buses and trains. Talking about secure connection, secure inform information about secure transfer connection. I mean, the technology is all there. I just took two pictures here from Zurich in Switzerland. Okay, we know Swiss clockwork, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, but this is an inside a bus at around midnight. Uh, next stop is, going, is being displayed up on top. Following stop Buchek Plus, and there's all the connecting routes. So far, so good. We have that here as well. But the next screen that showed up was okay. You have the following connections. It's route 72. It's route 11. It's route 16, uh, 69, and with all their real-time departure times. So that on the bus already you know okay. My connecting tram is on time. My connecting bus <coughs> is a bit late. Okay, so I still get it, and uh, so it's all there. Uh, transfer to trains. Yeah, I said we have Kent Station, unfortunately, where it is. So connecting the train to the bus, the train to the city. At the moment, it is only two routes. It's the 205, fortunately, to UCC, and CUH, CIT. But if you want to go to Mahan. You have to walk to get the 215. If you want to go to Black Rock, the same. If you want to go down Douglas Street, 206, you have to walk to the South Mel even. So have more buses actually to Kent Station. I know the routing is a problem with all the one ways, et cetera, et cetera, but there should be better connectivity between the two. And I know the 215, if anybody from Bus Aaron is here, no, I don't see anybody. The 215 connection is in the making, as far as I know, to Kent Station, but uh, just as a principle of observation. Uh, public transport and car cycling and walking. So public transport, you, you, very rarely the bus or the train stops right outside your house and on the other end it stops right outside your workplace or where you want to go. So the question is how to get to and from the bus or the train or how to cover the infamous last mile. So question access to bus or trains is if you want to walk, have a pleasant environment around bus stops, around stations, that you really want to walk there, that you can walk there in the st most straight and shortest distance uh, possible. That might be the question of permeability in suburban neighborhoods. That might be a question of, I'm coming out of Kent Station, do I see a natural desire line footpath to the city center? Um, bike and ride. So you can either do that at the start or at the end of the journey. So have uh, bike stands, secure bike stands at a station or have overnight parking or a bike, um, public bike station at the end of the journey. Park and ride, you would usually have that at the front end of the trip, people coming from where they're living uh, around Cork, go to, here it would be um, um, Black Ash and the Kinsley Road roundabout or it could be a station, say Little Island, say Middleton and then come in into town. Feeder buses, ride pooling, so uh, talking about Middleton, for instance, if there is a community bus or a town bus to bring people to the station, or kind of a paratransit, shared taxi, whatever ride pooling facility to bring people to the, to the station, it would be far, the catchment area would be far improved. Or if you want to cycle, you can also take the bike on the train. 
in theory. Unfortunately, here it's only off-peak. So how does that look like? Um, okay, we're just going to skip that. Um, access to public transport. This is two pictures, one from the Cologne area. You have the uh, sheltered bicycle parking right basically on the platform of the light rail into town. The other picture is taken from the Lewis Green Line in Dublin. Bike racks on the platform uh, in the Dublin outskirts. Um, at the end of the, of the trip, so if you come into Kent Station, if you come into Parno Place, the question is, where do I go from here? Uh, I could change to another bus, which might take time. The bus won't arrive, the bus, the bus is stuck in traffic, so I could switch to the bike. I could take a Coke bike, or I could have my own bike, provided I find it there in the morning where I left it in the evening. So the idea is have bike stations for secure, or service bike, bike stations for secure overnight storage. There is this old warehouse right next to Partner Place bus station, which I don't think there is, I don't know about plans what to do with it. So there could easily be put such a bike station into it, right next to Parnell Place, there's a big ground floor, open space ground floor. And the idea is to have service bike parking, double deck for better, um, uh, better user of space. You could have a little workshop there, get your bike serviced, get your puncture repaired, and uh, leave the bike there overnight, take the bus back to, say, Carrigaline, Glenmire, you name it, and find it back there the next morning. You can have lockable bike boxes, which I just recently saw here in, in Houston Station. Uh, what could you do with, with such a bike parking during daytime? But during daytime, there is a huge potential of city center employees who very often wouldn't know where to leave their bikes when they cycle in. Places like Brown Thomas, they might have their own bike parking, but smaller shops, they wouldn't have the place or the space to store a bike. And on a daily basis, you might not want to leave your bike outside in Patrick Street uh, from 9 to 5 or from 8 to 8 or whatever day in, day out. So this would also be an opportunity to, for safe bike storage during the daytime. Take your bike on the train. Um, in many cities across Europe, it's a matter of course that you're allowed to take your bike on the train. This is typical Berlin city center rush hour uh, scene. So you have a big bike symbol on the local trains. There are special compartments with flip seats where you can actually take your bike into, into the train. Uh, it is a wonderful combination, the quickest way to get around the city from the long distance you cover on the train, the first and the last mile you cover by bike. It's the quickest to get around, to be honest. And the latest trend is seeing that just in September on a trade fair, railway trade fair in Berlin. It's a train for Italy. You can even <coughs> plug your electric bike and recharge it while on the train. And talking about bikes, bike sharing, car sharing. So I think the whole sharing thing is a really good thing. So you don't need your own bike. You take a bike when you need it. You bring it back when you don't need it anymore. I don't have it with you all day. The same with the car. Uh, and this is, to me, this is public transport as well. So we see the Barclay bikes or Boris bikes from London. You see the transport for London Bull. I, this clearly indicates, yes, this is public transport. Uh, who is the biggest? bike sharing operator in Germany is German Railways. Who's the biggest bike sharing operator or bike rental operator in the Netherlands? It is Dutch Railways. Uh, Transport for London operating the, the, the Boris bikes. So here there's a really huge potential that these transport operators want to raise for the first and the last mile. There was a closure in the inner city railway line or commuter rail line in Berlin during the summer for two weeks. Deutsche Bahn actually advertised their own bikes officially to get around that, okay, it was through a large park, it wasn't too long, it was about three or four kilometers, they advertised their own rental bikes. Same for car sharing, and car sharing, I mean, what GoCar are doing. Uh, biggest operator for car sharing in Germany, German Rail. So they know that their customers don't do, usually don't do business where they're hopping off the train, so they need to go elsewhere. If you're coming down the intercity from Dublin, you need to do business in Kinsale, you could take a go-car outside the station, but of course it's not on your train ticket. So the question is, um, the question is, how do you integrate all this? And we come back to that in just one second. Uh, here again, you can, talk, you, you can also talk about car sharing, this small kind of smart cars. I've seen very little around here in Cork yet, but uh, they're very handy in larger cities. This fellow here, 
it's a little smart car. It is from Deutsche Bahn, car sharing bike fleet with an electric lead here, it's an electric car. Uh, so there is really a potential and that's what public transport operators are doing nowadays uh, on the continent. Complete different aspect again, intermodal integration, car and carpooling. Uh, I'm always amazed when I look, for instance, at Mahan. Mahan, Mahan Point Shopping Center, City Gate, there are about 7,000 jobs, and it's only accessible from the city center by public transport. Any place, carry the line, East Cork, North Cork, you won't get there other than by car. And then the N40 is chock blocked, and um, people are wondering why. So, but it is as it is, we have Dun Kettle, for instance, coming up. Dun Kettle Interchange is going to be messed up for the next three years until it's getting better. So the question is how to go around bottlenecks, how to get cars off the road. So there might be the typical carpooling. Idea is that two colleagues share the car journey. But what if the one colleague can't pick up the other colleague at their home? So colleague, colleague B's car needs to stay somewhere. So the idea is we need some car spaces or car parks where you can actually park and pool. So Johnny is coming from his home here, and uh, uh, Mary is coming from there. Mary is parking here. Need to leave that car somewhere, and then Johnny and Mary are going together in one car only, uh, say, to Mahan. It's one car off the road in the Jack Lynch Tunnel, one car off the road in the South Ring. But there needs to be something where, on a large scale basis, people can leave their cars for pooling. Things to think about, especially in the wake of Dunk Kettle being a constant bottleneck over the last next three years. Last, one of the last aspects now I mentioned earlier, why having one card for uh, the bikes, one car for the go car, one car for the bikes, and we have it here, one leap card, why can't we have it all on one single card? So the leap card should really integrate bus services, the city service of, uh, of Bus Aaron, not only the city service, but also the regional services. To my knowledge, you still can't get a ticket from, say, um, Macroom, including the city center or the city services here. There should be the trains, of course, on it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this is working more or less now, but the question is, okay, can't we have the Coke bikes in it as well? I know it's in the making. I don't know whether it's already done yet. Why can't we have Go-Car on it? If I have an annual ticket, for all Cork, for all public transport. Can't I have a reduction at least for go-car, for access to a go-car? Why is there a private operated, privately operated bus service, which also is public transport? Why aren't they included in the, um, in the leap cards? So the idea is actually to have everything together on one card, also services like bike sharing, like car sharing, which is becoming more and more common in continental Europe, to have the whole jigsaw of sustainable, sustainable mobility on one car. And if you have the whole jigsaw, and we're thinking about large scale developments, say in the Tivoli area, in the Docklands, Organs Key, why not actually make this as a package that comes with a place, with the apartment, that is part of the rent? You can say, okay, another 100 euro on top, but you have the complete mobility. You have a go car in your underground car park, you have um, you have uh, bike sharing, coke bikes outside your door. You have the full jigsaw of public transport, which can actually help uh, developers to save on cost for car parking. Okay, it's a question of building regulations, playing regulations. But these are all ideas that could help to uh, bring people more into the direction of active travel, of sustainable travel, of less car use. Last thought on public transport, I said, okay, um, I said earlier, Kent Station is where it is, unfortunately. If we can't bring the station to the city center, maybe we can bring the trains to the city center. And here's one wild idea. I know there is talk about the rapid transit corridor from Bellin College to the city center, Docklands, Mahan. Uh, whether that's going to be bus rapid transit or a Lewis type light rail, still to be seen. But we can at least. That's a wild idea. I hope nobody from Ian Rod Aaron is in the room. Uh, we have the two commuter lines to the east, to Middleton and to Cove. Very few stops. K okay, trains run every half hour, but they drop you at Kent Station because they can't go into the city center. So the idea is, like on the Lewis Green Line here on the old Harcourt, um, uh, Harcourt Street railway line, it was converted into a Lewis. Okay, 
the rail operation shut down years ago, was converted into a Lewis into a light rail and brought right into the city center to St. Stephen's Green. So the idea is, why not converting the East Cork railway lines, the East Cork commuter lines? There is no other freight traffic or whatever happening taking place. Convert that into light rail, bring the tracks here from Kent Station into the city center, have two stops, two, three stops here along the South Mill to the Grand Parade, and add additional step stops along the way at the new Docklands Bridge, at Silver Springs, at Tivoli. Tivoli is going to be, I don't know, 5,000 people living over the next couple of, well, over the next 10, 20 years. Have a park and ride at Dunkettle, have even better catchment in Middleton, have a new station at Water Rock, have a new station at Glanton Village. Uh, just an idea. Um, lots of technical implications, I know. Can't need to dis can't need discuss it. We can't discuss that all here, but um, just an idea. And the last thought is how could actually urban design, and there was quite a bit in, in uh, Catlin's presentation, uh, how could urban design actually promote more walking and cycling, more active travel, more healthy travel, more healthy environment? So of course, the most obvious is give more space to pedestrians and cyclists, and this happens now with the city center movement strategy here and there. Have high quality footpaths, other than concrete maybe, have it paved, have nice materials, good design, lighting, furniture, all this kind of belongs to a uh, high quality footpath. Improve the public realm, greening the streets, a shrub, a tree isn't a bad thing. Uh, there is very, very, very few trees in Cork city center streets. So, and there's a whole lot of advantages that trees have even with kind of preventing flesh flooding, etc. Improving air quality, you name it. Uh, safe and segregated cycling infrastructure, for safe cycling for all ages and abilities, of course. Attractive walking routes from or to rail or bus stations to the city center. And I know there is some challenges to urban planners, hostile environments, underpasses. If you have a look at the Sarsfield interchange, if you have a look at the underpass in Douglas, these are really kind of challenging uh, areas for uh, to make it a walking and cycling friendly environment. Uh, and one thing here at the bottom that I didn't want to miss out, it sounds banal, but the active travel infrastructure, that's also drain gullies. Shouldn't be rocket science. But when I cycled here, it was raining all afternoon. I went through puddles, through streams, actually, but there shouldn't be streams when the drains are working. And if you get splashed by cars passing by, it's not really advertising uh, walking or cycling. Rain shelters here or there, we are in a rainy place. There could be little canopies in front of shops where people could take cover, could take shelter, etc., etc. Footpath surface, okay, I'll leave that. Two, three pictures, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the situations that have room for improvement. This is not really inviting for pedestrians. Uh, talk about drain bullies. This actually cries out for redesign me, redesign the space, make something better of it. And here there's a picture from Carriga Line. Uh, it takes all the boxes, and uh, our colleague Lorraine Darcy from, from Dublin would be really kind of jumping for joy. It takes all the boxes for engineers. There is a cycle lane, there is a footpath, there is lighting, but it's just back on walls. It is absolutely unattractive for people to walk there. It is unsafe because nobody can see you if you're being rocked or attacked, and uh, this is not really an inviting walking environment. So let's talk about the good. Uh, if you have problems or issues with the elements, rain or sunshine, deal with it. Bologna has their arcades and um, good examples here from Cork Panel Place. I don't go into detail on that. And what a difference a tree makes here. See Barrick Street, see uh, this is around uh, Tory Tops Park. It is a difference to the picture we saw before. And, uh, and even if there was one or two car spaces taken away to park your bike outside your door and put a tree there. Lots can be won. Okay, I'm open for questions. I think I, yeah, I've been the last one in the row. Thank you. Just a quick word um, on behalf of the Planning Institute. We're working with Engineers Ireland to, here tonight and the um, sorry, uh, the CIHT. 
Um, so thank you again to all the, sp the speakers. And a lecturer once said to me, planning is an interdisciplinary profession. And it's perfectly true. We, work, we can't work in silos anymore. Times have moved on. And uh, there's so much crossover. And we've now, as a group of professions, we've all come to realize that. Um, and this event was uh, proof, really, that Twitter has its uses. A couple of quick tweets, and uh, we combined two events. So hopefully nobody, everybody got the message that last night was actually tonight um, from the Planning Institute's uh, event. And, uh, and thanks again. So hopefully we can do it again. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Quentin O'Connor, who's the events coordinator for the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation, and he's also a planner. Thanks. Hi. Um, just very quickly there, um, I just want to echo what uh, Valerie and what Tricia said there. I think uh, tonight was an excellent uh, example of uh, cross collaboration, and I mean it's evident by the speakers that we're here today. We have uh, we have planners, transport planners engineers and we've uh, people in mobility as well and it's so important for that cross collaboration to continue and work because it's it's not just about the institutions coming together to provide these events it's in our day-to-day -day roles also to come together because ultimately it's about achieving quality urban environments and improving mobility as well and I think we've witnessed all that today so um, yeah thank you again to the speakers and we'll open up questions to the floor what I'll ask is that before you ask a question, can you state your name, uh, who you represent, uh, who your question is for, and I urge you if you can tailor your question specific in such a way <coughs> to the content that you heard here today. Yep, that would be great. Uh, sorry, we'll go around with the microphone there. Any questions? <coughs> Any questions? Yeah, we have one here up front. Yeah, my name is Mary Gorn. I'm an architect cameraman and just representing myself. Um, my, my first question, following on from uh, Stefan's uh, address, is why can't we, I, I, and I don't want to start the rant, but why can't we have people who actually cycle, design, or at least check the, the cycle routes that are provided in the city? There are too many of these routes that start and just end just don't go anywhere. I mean, just try the new route around the Mercy Hospital, Brentwood Place. For a while, there was a cycle path going from Vincent's Bridge around Brentwood Place towards the Mercy Hospital, and then it just stopped. And you couldn't feed in with traffic because the motor traffic was coming from the opposite direction. And there are too many of these. There's another one along from Brentwood Place. It doesn't, it's like it starts halfway along the quay. Um, but, yeah. but it just doesn't go anywhere. And just, just, I'm thinking, you know, you're cycling along, and it's actually quite dangerous. I think, who, who designed these, or who, who monitors them? And also, what, what was said also in the last week, the, the huge pools, and these areas along that area of the river, where they've recently put these, um, I don't know what purpose, they put these rails along that route. And there are little channels to, so that water can, you know, discharge into the river, but they're all blocked up. Perhaps and there's Kevin, no maintenance. Um, so if you want to pick up on maybe some of the, the challenges in design and, and overcoming some of those challenges, is there anything you can draw from experience in, in London, perhaps? Or? Uh, don't, don't leave a traffic engineer out of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't design it, but you're right. I, I, and it's it's so common that you know cycle routes aren't designed by cyclists. Is seen as you know something oh we have to get in and cycle in and in in often cases uh, actually the cycling is more dangerous than taking the yes, road yeah. so i i agree and um, there is i suppose in the last few years they have tried to standardize cycle lanes and there's, a, there's an irish cycle manual i think isn't it that the nta have uh it's better i would say i don't know if it's perfect but it's certainly better um i think sometimes as well some yeah, there's, there's clearly just political decisions in some of the lanes you you mentioned they stop abruptly. Usually, it's because the you know it's councillors or wherever business don't want to take away on street parking, and they you know, they kind of almost the decision, I suppose. You know, so um, I don't know if that satisfies your, your question, but that is just an opinion on it. Yeah, 
know, just just following up with that, I'm basically on the same side of the table as you are. So as also as a member of the cycling campaign and in the transport and mobility forum, we're also kind of scratching our heads at some stage how this design uh, got together. But as Kevin said, there is kind of very often a, a very complex mix of interests and uh, I would be really most grateful if we could actually do what you uh, what you propose, get uh, some of the planners of the, of the people in charge on the bike and actually cycle those. So hopefully by their own experience, uh, there will be better design. I know, for instance, the, the Contra 4 bike down the Western Road, some of the design features, they were really kind of fought over with the guards, as far as I remember. Uh, Apparently, at the moment, there still needs to be some compromises being made. Let's talk about that 10 years later. Hopefully, it will be further up the, le the learning curve. Yeah, it's, it's where the trialing that I mentioned probably comes into place as well. It's where the trialing that I mentioned, that we don't oh, tend yeah. to do that in Ireland, but certainly, uh, you know, a trial could, could uh, probably resolve some of those issues. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Next question. Roland Lund, um, or representing us. Hi there. There was no mention of self-driving cars in any of the presentations, and presumably, you know, in ten years' time, when that technology is has, has become fairly established, car ownership, car usage, and <coughs> parking, a whole heap of other features will have changed utterly. And in designing, you know, an urban um, strategy, you know, ten years is not a, a very long time frame, so. Is there a, a policy or a group looking at that within the, the city, and just how is that being how is that being anticipated? It's an autonomous vehicle, as I think you were talking about, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a good point, and it isn't. I think it's something that needs to be dealt with at a national level, to be honest. And um, certainly, the technology is there. We, we've all seen it. Um, I'm not sure the legislation is there because uh, you know th there's no guarantee that at the moment they're not 100 percent full group either. And um, certainly they'll involve a loss of jobs, whether it could could, it could potentially you know, involve well, loss of public transport. From an urban planning point of view, from a space utilization, yeah. not legal or you know, Yeah, yeah, or and certainly there's opportunities there if, if they're regulating, if they're used for it, because it potentially frees up space in, in urban areas and potentially then you're looking at drop off areas outside or, or whatever yeah and um, it's difficult to say it's it, 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 i wouldn't say it's probably not been looked at at a city level you'd like you know, maybe i know certainly transport for london did have did have a, a dedicated person any if not a team looking at that uh, issue i don't know if it's done in ireland it's a fair point to think it's, it's probably a, a more natural. It was interesting that the trial was up in Dublin, Docklands, uh, a couple of months ago. It was Google had their automated car on that. So, like the Docklands is obviously, um, you know, when you're looking at an urban grid, it's, it's obviously going to be something that's uh, more naturally at home to something like that. Retrofitting it into a historic city centre um, and uh, around the city will obviously be more difficult. I don't, it's not being looked at, at at the moment, that's for sure. But certainly, it's not too far away. Just as, just as somebody observing uh, the whole transport technology scene, uh, I was really surprised to read uh, a couple of days ago that there is now a European legislation framework being passed just a couple of days ago that I think national legislation can follow suit because I I couldn't imagine seeing that uh, in the next 10 years or so with all actually the uh, liability implications that come with that. But apparently it is far further as I thought. Um, you're completely right, there should be provisions being made, uh, what the roads look like or have to look like in the next 20 years. In my presentation, I wanted to give an overview of what is already state of the art today and that what we hopefully would have in Cork on Ireland tomorrow or in the morning, next Monday, uh, get me right. And uh, I, I didn't actually look so far into the future as to yeah, how to deal with uh, autonomous vehicles. Is there one more question, or we might? Yeah. Yeah, two, two slightly different things. Um, first of all, just on the electric car and, and the change we're seeing in technology. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we thought we'd have tiny little computers on our wrists, and we'd have video phones, and we'd have this and that. You know, technology doesn't happen as we expect it, but we have convergence of mode. There's going to be no difference between your bike, the electric, or no fixed barrier between your bike and an electric bike, uh, an autonomous vehicle, 
and a public transport vehicle. You're going to get convergence of mode, and it's going to be everything. I think it's crazy that any development that's at a planning stage now includes any parking, because this will happen far faster than we can possibly imagine. When we hit the critical tipping point, it will be less than five years to going from autonomous vehicles or novelty to there are only autonomous vehicles and a non-autonomous vehicles and novelty. To go right back to the first two talks, um, I don't want to be you now focused. I don't really think that public realm is not important. It's absolutely vital. But we've seen a huge amount of good, really good public realm stuff in Cork, and there's a lot more coming, and we need a lot more. We're seeing an awful lot of office developments. We're seeing an awful lot of hotel developments. We're seeing retail developments. All of these are good. All of these, possible exception for retail, are necessary because we have a huge demand for office space, we have a huge demand for hotel space, we don't have demand for retail space. It is good that we see an improvement in our stock, but the biggest demand, and you've touched on this by far, the biggest demand we have in the city is for accommodation, for living. The cities are, go are changing from a place where people worked and left in the evening and came back in the morning to a place where people live and spend their lives. And I think that is a real challenge, and that's what we haven't seen enough of as of yet. Well, just to pick up on the last point, yeah, it's, it's the missing piece in terms of the city centre. Uh, I touched off the, we've broken down the neighbourhoods and look at the census information um, and the changes over the last three census periods, um, and the city centre and the capacity of the city centre to accommodate more uh, residential within its existing stock is, is massive. And why that's not happening, there's probably a range of, of reasons for it. Is it for happening it. and not being because there's a huge undercount in the census? The vast majority uh, of people I meet every day never go to the census. From well. observation of the city centre and the, city, the court at the heart of the city centre, no. Uh, but from observation of South Parish and, and Shandon, I would say there's a lot of operation outside the, the tax system and how things are, are, are converting all right because the LCI is a very attractive scheme and yet the take up is quite low and um, overall only 35 um, properties being taken it's, it's uh, it should be something that's rolling out we would go out and, and we drop brochures around different areas at different times and talk to people and um, i would say that there's an issue with that but i'd say the incentive for upper floor um, it will have to be looked at again at national level in terms of how to break down those recent changes in terms of exemptions to planning and um, from commercial to, to residential at, at upper floor use and changes to building regs, but I think the building regs is still a, a big issue. Okay, I'll just take one more the final question because I know people are eager to, to get home. Yep. Hi, I'm Warburg. I'm a um, uh, South Parish resident. And um, what I was interested in is earlier on you talked about um, the stakeholders that are involved in uh, some of your committees. And I did hear mention of um, residents in the city as stakeholders. And I was wondering how you're engaging with residents as stakeholders. Um, in, um, Shandon and Sarah would be extremely active and they'd be on the driving uh, in community groups for that neighbourhood. It's very dependent on the neighbourhood. There's a new residence committee in, in South Parish. I've inquired as well at City Hall and they don't have a list of local residence associations for the city. I've asked that. So okay, um, okay. Well, it, it, was, it was established last year as far as I know, uh, whether they're still functioning. Um, I'm not sure. But that was one of the missing pieces. We'd opened up a, a network event last year to try and, and engage with South Parish wider than the business communities. There's there's uh, older community groups there. Um, there's obviously the, the college um, and Nano Nagel Place engaging in different different the community groups within Nano Nagel Place engaging there as well. We'd find that it's it's very dependent on the group that's in the area. Like um, I see Bernard over there. Like Bernard would have. Um, in uh, the planet for South Parish before it was my area, and I know that Barrick Street was very active at that time. Um, but the, the community group there is, is um, isn't as active as it is now, and, and that switched down to Douglas Street. Um, I suppose in terms of the how we reach out, we can only reach out to active groups, and we would try and you know stimulate that. The PPN are there also to try and engage with that, um, but it's very much um, having to connect with, with, with groups that are already there. Um, the PPN is the natural home to, if you're trying to get something going. Uh, there's a coordinator that sits in the city, uh, in the city council as well, um, and, and they can help in terms of getting new community groups or new residence groups up on their feet. But that has to come from the community. Yeah. Okay. Very last one there. Yeah. Can I just add that um, 
perhaps, certainly from, I live in town, but I, I don't live in Cork City, um, two things. One is that residence groups seem to come together when there's an issue, something they want to kick, up, kick against or, or get. Um, one way or another, they, they tend to, sorry, uh, residence groups tend to form and become active in periods when they want something or they want to kick against something. Um, and maybe it's an opportunity to form a register over time and keep things going, and give them some funding, get them more engaged. <coughs> um, that's the first thing. And then finally, for Stefan, in London you can use your contactless bank card everywhere on public transport. And then if you spend so much in a week, they will actually cap it and give you a refund if you've overspent. In Dublin, your leap card can now be used with the go-card scheme. In Mallow, we have a leap card uh, gadget on the platform, and you can only use it if you've got a season ticket. We have commuter rail service into Cork. It's not integrated, and it's a third more expensive than it should be mile for mile compared to East Cork. So it's not there yet. And Irish Rail, we've had negotiations with Irish Rail. They're not. They're not playing. So there's there's a bigger picture. So I suppose what I'm saying. So, thanks. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd want to respond to that, or is there any? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to, I suppose, I found that really enthusing and kind of inspiring uh, hearing from the people who speak today, or the speakers, Stefan, Paul, Larkin, and Kevin. Um, I'm sure you all agreed you will find their, their talks, their uh, topics very interesting. Uh, by the way, can you show their appreciation, your appreciation for us? <laughs>